from the number one best-selling author of Life Rescripted. You're now tuning in to the Year of Purpose podcast. I'm Zephan Moses Blacksburg. Born into a family of carnival owners in Texas, USA, Maxwell Ivy lost his sight at age 12. Having a natural gusto for life, Max graduated college and became heavily involved in the Eagle Scouts. He also worked in the family business alongside brothers until his father succumbed to lung cancer. Faced with his own mortality, Max made some life-altering changes. He underwent gastric surgery and lost over 250 pounds. He started his own business, buying and selling amusement rides, and learned how to blog using software for visually impaired people. Overcoming many obstacles, Max made a name for himself online and now shares his experiences on The Blind Blogger. Max, thanks for being here today. Well, thanks for having me on today. I'm looking forward to having a good conversation and see if we can't inspire some people to, to take some actions today. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, just reading your bio, I feel like I have to jump back here to as a kid. What happened? You know, it's it's so interesting because some people are born without their sight, and some people do have sight for a certain amount of time, and then something happens to them. And so, I'm curious to hear a little bit about your perspective of you know, at one point in time, you knew what things looked like, and and something happened, uh, and now you experience the world a little bit differently. So, I'd love to hear just kind of what happened when you were 12 and uh, where it went from there. Okay, I was uh, born with perfect vision. I have retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative disease that attacks the retina. And I gradually lost vision from about age four or five. Uh, I had a large drop off in vision at 12 or 13, which is pretty common for men with RP. And it stayed pretty much constant. Uh, at um, you know, I had decent vision for traveling around, but couldn't, you know, n- not good vision for reading. It stayed that way till I was in my late teens, early 20s, and then I lost it down to what I have now, which is light perception. And uh, I think it is uh, it is interesting when you uh, talk to people who were born with no vision versus people like me who had vision and lost it, because at least some of the some references I understand that a person who's born totally blind will never understand, such as such as colors. Uh, you know, there are certain uh, cultural icons that I re- that I understand what they are. Uh, I lost m- most of my vision before the swoosh, but I can at, I at least know what the McDonald's arches and the Coca Cola logo look like. <laughs> I, I can remember the Flintstones telephone, and you know I can remember a, a box of sixty four Crayola crayons. So uh, you know those are some. Those are some concepts that make life a lot easier if you don't have vision. At least I think so. So, uh, and the other thing about losing your vision gradually is, is you learn from an early age that very little is going to ever stay the same. Because I've gone in my lifetime from uh, reading regular print to having to wear glasses to reading large print type uh, to having to use a uh, closed circuit TV where you put the book under a camera and it projects it up onto a monitor uh, to learning braille and now most everything I get is either on digital audio or uh, listen to using a screen reader from the computer so you know that's just one area of my life where from you know being a kid to being an adult things had to just constantly learn a new way to do the same thing yeah, and I'm sure that that happens for many people throughout their life where uh, regardless of what they're going through, you know, they probably change the way that they do things or the world changes it for them. Uh, you know, as we get older, uh, you know, I can't exactly behave the same way I did as a kid uh, when I'm working with a client. Uh, so the world definitely changes things. But it's interesting to see how, you know, your way of interacting with the world changed for you you. I'm wondering if, uh, and this is something I've always been curious of, you know, they they always have those uh, superhero movies where if someone loses their sight, they might develop a super crazy hearing. Have you noticed that any of your other senses have really started to take over or uh, get more sensitive as time's gone by? Uh, uh, actually, I'm a bad example of that because my smell has never been good and it's never gotten better. <laughs> 
But uh, I would say the the one the one difference is you know Stephen Covey he's he's well known in the field he 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 wrote several great chapters in his book about active listening about really paying attention to the person that you're that you're talking to and and uh, really being invested in the conversation and I think that that's really more of what happens is is that you just focus in on the senses that you have left and you spend more time uh, honing those those senses just like with anything else if there's if there's something that you're bad at you might make up for it with with other things that you're good at or that you can become better at and I think that's the way it is with hearing uh, I've I also was smart with my hearing and you know avoided things like rock concerts and jet airplanes and uh, you know never never been a guitar player or any any of the things that would 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 decrease your hearing level knowing that I would have to depend on it more. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I think that's a smart choice because it'll allow you, you know, later down the road when you really do need to rely on that stuff uh, to take advantage of still having your hearing. I know uh, me personally, I, I played drums for many years. I've been to concerts and, uh, you know, sure. even at uh, 26 going on 27, I know that sometimes my hearing is, is starting to go. Um, and that's a bit scary for me. Uh, it's still being quite young. So, um, you know, I can definitely see where making those choices really would make a big difference in the future. Um, I'd love to jump forward just a little bit here and hear a little bit about, um, you know, understanding your own mortality and what happened for you when you realized that, uh, you know, we don't live forever and the life that we do have is important. I know that some big life changing things happened for you, uh, both in your family, but also for yourself and losing a lot of weight. So maybe share with us a little bit about that. Yeah, I was uh, still traveling with the carnival, although this was after our show had went out of business. We were working with my uncle's carnival, and I wasn't uh, wasn't handling it well because we used to compete pretty heavily with them for bookings. So it was not fun having to to realize that my carnival was no longer in business, but theirs was. So that plus the loss of my father, I was was never what you'd call in good shape. Uh, put on even more weight, and uh, eventually I had a situation where I was almost thrown out of a motel for urinating on their mattresses and somebody noticed that that day that my the skin on my legs was tight and discolored and you know I went to see a doctor and the doctor said you know you need to make some changes or you're not going to be around here much longer uh, at the end of that season I went home and got a primary care physician that was able to you know they put me on medication for blood pressure for gout and I was on six or seven different pills at, at one time and you know the the first thing they realized is that I wasn't getting good rest so they had me get a sleep study and eventually I was treated for sleep apnea with a CPAP machine and a few years after that after realizing that uh, diet and exercise on my own wasn't getting me any real progress towards losing the weight I'd agreed to go to a seminar and find out about gastric surgery and once I realized that uh, gastric surgery was just another tool that some people used because they weren't able to accomplish their weight goals without it and that it still would require making a lot of changes and doing a lot of hard work I was in because I want these people, if you tell me it's easy, I'm probably not interested, but if you tell me that I'm going to have to do some work, then I'm there. So uh, I had the surgery, I went to the nutrition classes, uh, I changed my diet, uh, started exercising more regularly than I was, and over the course of the six months before the surgery, I lost 81 pounds, and then since the surgery, I lost another 160 pounds, so I'm down to 255, 260, as opposed to over 500, which is a much healthier weight for me now, and I'm able to maintain the weight uh, even with the, the holidays season meals that are problems for most people uh, you know here it is it'll be uh, four years well it was four years a couple weeks ago I had my first weigh in on April uh, excuse me on Valentine's Day 2012 so it's been four years since my first weigh in I'm at my good weight and I'm still at my at the weight my doctor wants me to be at and uh, you know I don't think I would have been able to accomplish it without having the surgery and you know, some people don't need it. Some people aren't in the right frame of mind 
where it will succeed if they have it. I think the one interesting thing I found out during the whole process is only about 50% of the people that have a gastric procedure will lose 80 to 90% of the weight they need to lose. Wow. And that some people will even gain weight. Uh, they may drop the weight, but they may come back to their original weight and put pounds on in addition to that, even with a surgery. Well, I mean, kudos to you for pulling that off, uh, number one, because, I mean, that means that you weren't in that 50% of people who don't do it. It sounds like you've done amazing with it. And, you know, I never want to scare anyone into uh, bettering themselves or realizing, you know, that a change needs to happen. Um, You know, are there any... Were there signs for you that were popping up in your life where you started to think, oh, you know, I think it's time that I need to make a change? Or, you know, what was kind of going on in your mind at the time? Because it's interesting to see how far people push their bodies until finally, you know, something really bad happens and then they finally decide to make that change. Well, I think I have. I've, I've been fat most all of my life. Uh, when I was younger, they would refer to it as husky or as being a big kid. But, um, you know, the last, I would say there was two or three years there where I went from being about, when I went from being about 400 to being over 500. And my brother has a picture where he says it looks to him in the picture like I was more like 600 or more. Uh, I think that in that, in that, you know, three years after my father's death, and after I was no longer really involved in the business the way I was before, you know, having to accept the fact that what the the that the person that you have been, the, the way you see yourself uh, for many years of your life is no longer is no longer possible. That takes a while to finally accept. And you know, I I would agree with you. It's it's a shame it took a a drastic event and. You know, people telling me that if I didn't make serious changes in my life, I wasn't going to be around here much longer. But, you know, for a lot of people, that is what it takes. It takes getting to the point where uh, they realize they don't have a choice. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I share my story is because I really don't want to see people get to the point where I'm at or was at. Um, And... I think there's a lot of little things that people can do as far as as far as maintaining their weight or any other aspect of their physical, mental, spiritual health uh, that they can. Um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people they they get overwhelmed with all the things that are wrong or that they need to improve, as opposed to just doing something about uh, one aspect of it that they can do something with. I mean. Uh, I look at all the changes I've had to make as far as from the beginning to the before the surgery to when I actually had the surgery. I mean, uh, for a while there, I had to give up completely give up caffeine. Uh, I have to make a real effort to drink more water now. Um, I take supplements every day. The the portions that we eat have changed. The the types of foods, the way they're prepared. Uh, the you know, I now get at least 30 minutes of exercise every day. There's, you know, a lot of things that have changed that, to get me to where I'm at now. And if, you know, if I as as like just like when the when I went to the first class with the nutritionist, they said, you know, you're going to have to make a lot of changes in your life, but you don't have to make them all right now. What we advise you to do is to pick one thing and do that for a month. And then after you've done that for a month, pick another thing and do that for a month and add to it. And eventually you add all of these small changes together that you've built into habits and you succeed at losing the weight and keeping it off. And I had to wait six months before the insurance company would pay for the procedure. And in that six months, I made a lot of small changes and I lost 81 pounds. Well, I want to reiterate something that you just said here, uh, because I think it's super important. And this is something that I can definitely relate to. You know, you talk about 
doing this one thing. Um, and there's actually a great book called The One Thing. And it's all about, you know, figuring out what is the one thing that you have to do to make a huge change in your life. And, you know, looking back at when I made the decision to uh, leave my nine to five job to start a business, you know, I, I never thought I could do it because I didn't know how I didn't know where to start. Uh, and my biggest fear was that I wouldn't be able to replace my income. And I always tell people the story about how I had someone who literally sat down with me and broke it down and said, okay, you know, how much are you making right now? And I was just making 30000 a year. That was roughly my salary. And he said, well, let's just assume, you know, you work five days a week and there's 52 weeks in the year, but you get two off for being sick or vacation or whatever. So essentially you're working, uh, you know, 50 weeks out of the year, five days a week. So you work 250 days a year. And if you take that $30,000 and you divide it by 250, you get the exact amount of how much money you just need to make each day. And he, you know, did the math there and he said, you know, you only have to make $120 a day. And when he changed that in my mind for me, it was no longer my one goal is to make 30000 a year. It was my one goal is to make $120 a day, five days a week for 50 weeks out of the year. It made it so much easier to follow through with that plan. And I'm sure you saw that too. Once you just picked one thing and focused on it and stayed with it, uh, I, I think it made it so much easier to see those results happen. Yeah, and that applies to my business as well, because when I first decided to start my own business helping people sell amusement equipment, I didn't have the first clue how I was going to do it. I didn't know anything about a website or uh, you know, or, or even how we were going to find out about doing a website. Uh, but the first thing I did was file for the domain name. I came home from an event where I should have made a lot of money and didn't make any money, was totally disgusted, and I said, you know, I've... I've been talking about doing this full time and making a real change in my life for a few years now. I haven't done it. If I'm not going to do it, when? And so to, I said, so I called my brother up and I said, you know, Michael, uh, go online and, and register the domain midwaymarketplace.com for me. And it wasn't until five months later that we had a website. But, you know, I knew that that was the ultimate, that was one of the first goals we had to have as far as becoming a full-time amusement equipment broker was to have a website because everybody said if you're going to do this and especially Max for somebody who's not going to be able to travel and go meet people face to face as easily as other people do it uh, you need to have a website so that was the first thing and uh, my brother eventually figured out a way to, to create a, a simple site with us with a uh, plug-in from SourceForge that would allow me to upload photos and ride descriptions where I really didn't have to know anything about how the website ran. And then a few months after that, Michael got a high paying job moving rides for a carnival on the East Coast and I had to learn how to maintain and update my site. So I went to the W3 school and you know they have tutorials where the first thing is uh, the home the home page, mm -hmm. you know, then links, then Im embedding images. And I would just work through each section and copy what they did and then try to do it on my site and sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't uh, but I just continued to do the one ne the next thing that I thought I needed to do in order to help people sell their equipment and to generate commissions to where I could bring in income and and make this thing make this thing work and it's you know I, keep, I actually keep a copy of my original the first time I created the home page for my website uh, I keep that because it's, it was ugly. It was gaudy. It was, <laughs> uh, it was, it was bright yellow background, uh, dark blue text, red links, and orange. If you click the link, to, so it would remind you that you've been to that link before. Uh, and so a few people complained about how bright it was, but I was able to sell equipment with it. And a few years later, I would eventually move over to WordPress and change it to a more traditional white with black text and a few images. But even the images weren't, you know, all that great because I didn't have a way to edit them or format them or resize them. So I basically had put up whatever they sent me, and you know, I might have four or five different size images on one page. Right. Uh, but did I worry about how it looked? No, I worried about getting people the ability to see the equipment so that I could sell it to them. 
and it worked. And it did, you know, I'm uh, I'm not going to win any prizes like I used to, like I tell people back when we used to have our carnival. We didn't win a lot of style points, but we got open. My website didn't win a lot of style points, but I sold rides. And that's what I like to tell people is to do that one thing and uh, whether it's starting a website or a blog or a podcast or uh, any type of new business like you were doing, it's about breaking it down into the various steps and doing the ones that you can and not really worrying too much about the ones you can't. Well, I want to pull out another great lesson here that you brought up, and that was that far too many people are concerned with how something looks, you know, and they waste so much time on the look as opposed to the functionality. Uh, and, you know, you really were able to create something that regardless of the colors, uh, and, and I think it's important to add that you made a website without the ability to see it. So I think that's amazing in its own right. The fact that you were able to create something uh, that is meant to be a visual for other people without being able to do that yourself, I think that's a feat in itself. And I think that you're totally right that you don't have to win the style points. You know, if it works, that's all that really matters. And I think far too many people either uh, you know, give up too soon or don't even finish their idea or, or their dream that they were working on because, you know, they want to see the whole picture uh, when really that's not how life works. That's not how anything works. You know, you can have this big idea in your head, but I don't think you'll ever see the complete big picture of how it's actually going to be. Uh, and if you let that paralyze you from moving forward, you're never really going to get to where you want to be. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm, I'm sure we both know a lot of people who they're constantly redesigning their website. They're always trying to make it look better or work better as opposed to investing that same time in creating content for the site or promoting the site or uh, reaching out to people for collaborative opportunities based on what their site is all about. And But, but you know, there are always looking for that next plug-in that's going to make their site do something that it doesn't right now and for most people it is they're just too worried about the the style points about the the way it looks as opposed to whether or not it does the job of communicating to people that this is the service I offer or this is the product I have for sale or this is the problem I can solve for you yeah, definitely. And so let's move forward a tiny bit just to the blind blogger and tell me where did the idea for this come from? Because I know originally you were making these sites to sell equipment uh, and now you have your own website where you blog about all sorts of topics. So how did you uh, get into this idea, you know, and, and start this as a business? Well, it was, uh, it wasn't really my doing in the beginning. Um, I was uh, I was on social media and uh, blogging to promote the equipment sales and more and more people started commenting on how inspiring it was to the, the fact that I was doing all the things that go into uh, into having a website and a blog and recording videos and social media, email lists, all the stuff that I was doing and they said I really should have a site where I would share more about the personal aspects of doing this and doing it as a blind person and originally my thought was well I'm not it's I'm not an inspiration I'm just a guy who shows up every day and works hard to build a business for his family but as many people have pointed out to me Max there are a lot of people out there who have no physical disability there's no real excuse or reason why that uh, they aren't doing more with their lives and they need people like me who are showing up every day to share the story because as it's been explained to me if I had decided to sit on the couch and watch TV and eat junk food nobody would have thought a second thought about it and the fact that I don't allow myself to to be satisfied with with uh, with with you know a nothing life with uh, with even even what I've done to this point you know I'm always open to the next challenge or the next opportunity that comes along and they say the the fact that I do that when so many people who don't so many people who who could don't is uh, something the world needed and so I started this the website and when I started decided to start a second website I asked people well what should I call it 
and they were like, Max, we've been calling you the blind blogger for a long time now. Why don't you just see if that if that domain is available? And sure enough, the blindblogger.com was taken, but the blindblogger.net was available. And I need to check back and see if the .com has expired yet because the, the, the fellow that has that domain name, near as we can figure, he writes about being a blind drunk. Hmm. So I wouldn't mind having the other domain. I'm not going to pay big money to, to, to wrest it away from somebody else. But, you know, it's in, just in both cases, the Midway Marketplace and the Blind Blogger, I'm generally referred to as Mr. Midway or the Blind Blogger online. And both of those names were given to me by people who follow my work. And, you know, I was fortunate that my brand names were given to me. I didn't have to go out and figure out what I wanted to call myself. So uh, the blindblogger.net, and uh, it's given me a, a place where I can uh, share my experiences as far as the process, you know, like what it was like to write my first ebook. Uh, what it was like to finally admit that I am an inspiration. Uh, I wrote a post about how I, I have what I call the ice tray challenge because I, I started filling the ice trays, which is a little more difficult than you would think if you have no vision to, to keep those fill those darn things and keep them level. But it was really more about the fact that it was a small gesture I was performing for my family and didn't realize how big a deal it was to, to them until they started telling me. So. You know, those are some of the things I've written about, and of course, I also write about uh, when people interview me, or when I do guest posts, or when people ask me to co contribute to articles or whatever. So it's, and I'm I'm starting to invite other people because there are quite a few other people out there that are visually impaired that have blogs or podcasts, and some of them are even a lot more talented than I am at it. So it's also nice when I can want to bring some of those people in on my site and ex expose them to the to the world because they're as as you know there are a lot of talented people in fields there you know there are other guys out there podcasting who uh, just aren't being found because they aren't as active promoting themselves mm -hmm. I've you know I've become the the blind blogger I'll never I'll never try to claim I'm the only one but I was one of the, the first to really be out there on social media in groups on LinkedIn and Facebook, um, you know, building my email list. And so I've, I've kind of got the, the nickname, but there are a lot of other people out there, and I'm happy when I can share some of those other people with the world. And here lately I've been, been, been lucky enough that I've even gotten some of those other people uh, interviews on radio shows and podcasts like yours. So... That's awesome. I, I think that's amazing to see where it's gone. And, uh, you know, Max, this has been a great conversation. Uh, we're just getting towards the end of our interview here. But, you know, I would love to just remind everybody where they can go to find more information, you know, what that website URL is. And I think that that, that ice tray challenge is actually very creative. I really do like that because it's such a small thing to do for uh, for most people, for for you, it's you know it takes definitely a lot more. But I think uh, being willing to step out there and do something outside of your comfort zone that really means a lot to other people, uh, you know, that's really what life is all about. And so I think that's a really cool thing. I'd love to read more about it. So if you could, Max, just share with everyone again, what's the URL for your website and where can they find you on Facebook and things like that. Yeah, they can go to theblindblogger.net. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Maxwell Ivy. On Facebook, it's uh, facebook.com slash theblindblogger. Um, I'm per Maxwell Ivy on Blab, Pinterest, Instagram. Uh, I used to create different pages for the Midway Marketplace and the Blind Blogger, but I've realized since then it's a whole lot easier just to create one identity of Maxwell IV and have have posts about either as as they as they come along, uh, and YouTube.com slash Maxwell IV. So, uh, and I'm just about finished with my second book, which I'm which I'm calling "It's Not the Cookie, It's the Bag: uh, Lessons I Learned About Weight Loss While Preparing to Have Gastric Surgery," and that'll. Uh, is going to my editor this week and will be out on the website hopefully in the next 30 days or so. 
And as I've been told, you can never have too much advanced publicity for an ebook. So I'm starting to mention that one in addition to the one that everybody has already heard about, Leading You Out of the Darkness into the Light, a blind man's inspirational guide to success, which is available on Amazon and CreateSpace, but they can find all of that on my website, theblindblogger.net. It's also where, they, also where they can reach out to me for personal coaching or to be part of my group coaching or to uh, to, to hire me for, for speaking or to give a presentation. And I'm more than happy to do presentations online via Skype, Zoom, or other methods as well as in person. It's just a matter of what works best for the the person that's wanting to hear my message and have me share my story. That's awesome, Max, and thank you so much for sharing your story here today on the podcast. And I definitely look forward to heading on over to that website and learning more. And uh, congrats on getting that second book out there. So everyone should be checking that out over on your website and on Amazon. And uh, thanks for being here today. Well, thank you so much for uh, for deciding to have me on the podcast. Um, I've been very fortunate that just about every time I've reached out to somebody to do an interview, they've said, yes, uh, please, our listeners need to hear you. But uh, I know that there's always the possibility that they could say no, so I appreciate it, and I'm very grateful and uh, humble. And I I feel like this is my opportunity to, to share my story and hopefully motivate people to take that one concrete action every day. It isn't the big things you do. It's those little small steps you take, especially in the early days when – you're scared to death, and it takes everything you have just to take to put that one toe in the water or to crack the door open and look out through that little little bit of light that's shining through that door. And that's what I need. That's what people need to do more of, is to, this, because it's those small steps, those small acts that lead to the big accomplishments. And um, I hope to hear from some some of your listeners that uh, I have helped them to uh, to actually do something, to actually take those steps. Hey everyone, it's Zeph. Did you like this episode? Be sure to subscribe so that you can tune in next week and tell a friend about the show. If you want access to free training and exclusive interviews on success, happiness, lifestyle design, and adventure, visit me at yearofpurpose.com. Until next time, go out and let life surprise you so that you can live a life rescripted. scripted